This is part four of my American road trip series, in which I'm narrating one scary story from every US state. You can check out the other episodes after this video. Don't worry, you don't have to listen to them in order. Thank you to everyone who's emailed in their story so far. Now, get ready, as we approach the halfway point of our journey, down route 666. I've always been the outdoorsy type, and whenever I have some free time, I like to get out into nature. This particular day, I was hiking in Malheur National Forest in Oregon, a beautiful part of the country. It was a weekday, so I was out there by myself. Not that that bothered me. I was used to solo hiking. Plus, it was broad daylight outside. That, paired with the beautiful scenery, didn't exactly fill me with a deep sense of dread. It took me about an hour to drive from my home to the spot I planned to hike in, a secluded part of the forest where I figured I'd be alone. I parked my vehicle in an area where there was no other cars around, hopped out and threw on my backpack. Then I set off into the woods. The sky was blue, the air fresh, and the trees were lush. A perfect day for a walk in the woods. No more than two minutes in, however, I stumbled upon something. I wish I hadn't. It started with the strange noises. A guttural chanting. Sounded like five or six human voices, all speaking gibberish in a melodic fashion. I could only hear it faintly in the distance, but curiosity got the better of me. I made my way through the brush, intent on seeing who else was out in this secluded part of the forest. That's when I saw them. It was like a scene straight out of a David Lynch movie. Six people, standing in a wide circle, all their faces covered in poor quality paper mache masks. One was what looked like a pig, one a hare. I couldn't even make out what the others were supposed to be. None of them were wearing shirts, and their torsos were covered in what looked like white paint. They were moving their bodies in a strange, wave-like motion, holding what looked like primitive ceremonial sticks. They must have been off their heads on some sort of chemical. It looked like they might have been standing around something on the ground, but I couldn't make out what it was. Before I could turn around and get out of there, one of them caught sight of me. I'll never forget that image. It was so bizarre and terrifying all at the same time. A man in a bootleg white rabbit mask, pointing in my direction. And then, in unison, all these other masked figures turning to look at me. I immediately turned and bolted back to my car. Behind me, I could hear the breaking of twigs, the rustling of foliage, and multiple sets of footsteps. The worst part was the screaming. Wild screaming. The masked figures were in hot pursuit chasing close behind me. What the hell did they want? From the sound of their wails, I could hear that they were gaining on me. I ditched the bag on my back to lighten the load. I was fit enough to outrun those lunatics, but not with that thing slowing me down. In 30 seconds, I was back at my car. In another 10 seconds, more of them had appeared from other parts of the surrounding forest. Couldn't have been less than 20 of them now. A menagerie of psychos, all throwing rocks and sticks at my vehicle, charging directly at it, the fastest ones clawing at the windows. I floored it in reverse, and managed to back out of there just before my car was surrounded. I spun the vehicle around, and slammed my foot on the accelerator. As I sped down the muddy trail, I could see the masked figures in my mirrors. They were still running after me, still screaming, but thankfully losing distance. When I was far enough away, they sidelined back into the trees and out of my vision. That was the last I saw of them. I debated whether or not to report the incident. In the end, I decided I would. I told the authorities what had happened to me, and they told me that they'd check the place out. Never heard back from them. 
I don't think they took my call too seriously, which, honestly, bothers me. A few people have gone missing in those woods over the years. It'd be nice if they saw this as a potential lead. I get what I told them must have sounded crazy, but still, for the sake of the missing, you know. I have no idea what I stumbled into on that hike, but my gut tells me it was some crazy type of ritual. This only happened to me last year, so if you're listening to this, and you're planning to head out to Malheur National Forest, please, take precautions, because there's something strange going on out in those woods. It's no secret in my family that my grandpa used to be part of the mob. Back when the casino started booming, he was working out in Las Vegas, protecting his mafia family's interests. What his exact role was, I can't say for sure, but he was sort of a mid-level guy. Not a kingpin, not a grunt. Now in telling this story, I don't expect you to feel any sympathy for the guy. He did some bad things in his youth, that's for sure, but he did make amends later in life. He made a series of confessions to my father, believing that if he took his secrets to the grave, he'd be doomed to hell. He was never proud of his past, and he wanted to repent a little, I suppose. My father then passed those tales on to me. There are several stories I could share with you here, but I'll just tell one from his time out in Nevada. One which, if true, I find particularly disturbing. A few other gangsters in my grandpa's crew had been caught stealing from their boss, shaving a little extra off the side and pocketing it for themselves. This wasn't their first offence, and the boss wanted to make an example of them. The poor guys weren't the smartest, and didn't even realise they'd been rumbled until it was too late. The three of them were rounded up, bound and gagged, and tossed into car trunks. About fourteen other guys drove them out into the middle of the desert, my grandpa was there with them, riding in the same car as the boss. Far from civilization, they popped the trunks and dragged the three men out. My grandpa's boss gave some speech about how they had wronged him and how they were now going to pay the price. He untied their hands and feet and tossed each of them a shovel, told them to start digging three deep holes. Since all of the boss's henchmen were armed, they didn't exactly have a choice in the matter. The men tried to plead with the boss, but nobody could understand what they were saying through the gags in their mouths. My grandpa didn't want to be a part of this. He knew these guys after all. Still, there was nothing he could really do. If he spoke out against the boss, or tried to leave, then there'd likely be a fourth hole out in that desert. The men finished digging their pits, which, as instructed by the boss, were much deeper than they were wide. Then, at gunpoint, he had them get inside their makeshift tombs. The other henchmen began to fill in the holes with earth and sand, compressing it all tightly together, leaving only their three heads poking out of the ground. They couldn't move, they couldn't talk, all they could do was pray. According to my grandpa, the boss then placed a bottle of water about ten feet in front of them, with the top off. This is the only thing out here that'll keep you alive he said, and you're going to watch as it evaporates in front of you. That is, if the buzzards don't peck your eyes out first. Then they all hopped back in their cars and left the three men there, buried in the scorching heat. On the way back to Vegas, the boss sat silently, looking out the car window. He turned to my grandpa. The water, he said. What about it, boss? I'm just thinking, if one of them manages to shake himself free, I wonder if he'll share it. It didn't really matter, my grandpa thought. Those men were so far out in that desert that they'd never make it back alive anyway. It was just a question of how long they lasted. My grandpa managed to escape his life of crime a few years later. His wife, my grandma, had just given birth to my father, and even though he was still a young man, he figured it was time for a fresh start. He never spoke out against his former colleagues, I guess for obvious reasons, 
and somehow he managed to escape without being whacked. Must have made some kind of deal. For his future family's sake, I'm glad he did. Here's a glitch in the Matrix that's kept me up for more than a few nights. For as long as I can remember, I've had a memory that apparently never even happened to me. It's extremely vivid, almost like I can feel what's happening in the memory itself whenever I think about it. The memory stayed the same since I was a kid. It starts with this horrible, pale man looking in at me through a window. His skin is so thin, it's almost translucent. His eyes are a sickly yellow, and they're sunken deep in his skull. His whole face is emaciated and bony, and his mouth is contorted into a menacing smile. In a flash, he's in the same room as me. I don't know where we are. Some sort of dark, featureless place. But it's just the two of us, and I have no idea why I'm there. The pale man slowly approaches me with his arms outstretched, and I'm overcome with this feeling of pure fear. Then, pure pain. Next thing I know, I'm in a hospital on a stretcher, being wheeled into the emergency room. I can't really feel the lower half of my body, and everything's a little blurry. The doctors have concerned looks on their faces, and one of them keeps repeating, Stay with me, Tom. Stay with me, Tom. The strange thing is, my name's not Tom. It's Jason. I look up at the doctor talking to me. I still remember his face like it was yesterday. Paper thin lips, a brown moustache, piercing blue eyes, a big mole over his eyebrow. The scene goes on like that until I lose consciousness. Then everything goes black. That's where the memory ends. As a child, I brought the memory up to my parents. They assured me I had never been rushed to the hospital, let alone to the emergency room. Throughout the years, I'd periodically bring it back up whenever it popped into my head. Still, they'd always tell me I was just remembering some weird nightmare or something. For the longest time, I put it down to me watching some kind of scary movie before bed, and my young, impressionable mind confusing a dream with reality. When I was 18, my family and I moved to Chicago. I had a minor medical problem that needed monitoring, and I needed to make a trip to the local hospital. I was sitting in the waiting room, surrounded by a handful of other people. An old lady, a mother and a child, and a man with his head burrowed in a newspaper. Eventually, the doctor came out and called my name. I looked up at him, and I couldn't believe my eyes. It was the doctor from my false memory. The same thin lips, piercing blue eyes, even the same distinctive mole over his eyebrow. He looked older, sure. His moustache was more grey than brown now, and there were a few deep wrinkles on his skin, but there was no mistaking it. If that memory really never happened to me, then how was that even possible? My heart began to race as I stood up and moved towards him. With a reassuring smile, he ushered me into the examination room. Now, in private and up close, I was able to get an even better look at the guy. It was him all right. He wasn't just a character from a dream at all. But if that experience from my memory had never really happened, how could I have known this man's face? Why had it been stuck in my head for my entire life? During his examination, I told him he looked familiar. He assured me we had never met. I grew up in Texas, and he'd never even been there. Not to mention, there was no record of me as a patient there, and the doctor said he had a keen eye for faces. I figured it was some kind of weird coincidence, a sort of mind glitch. My brain must have been making a connection that wasn't really there. Still, I couldn't help but feel a little uneasy. The doctor finished up his examination, told me everything looked good. He then gave me a smile and showed me the door. I walked out into the waiting room, and the doctor called his next patient. 
it was the man with his head in his newspaper, sitting just to the right of me. He stood up and towered over the doctor and I. Couldn't have been less than six foot six. He came to pass me, and I looked up at him. Those sickly, sunken eyes. Those emaciated cheeks. That cellophane-like skin. It was him, the menacing figure from my memory. The doctor looked older, but this guy, this guy hadn't changed, hadn't aged a day. But it's what he said to me as we passed that stuck with me the most. He looked down at me and smiled that contorted smile. Good to see you again, Tom. My heart slammed against my ribcage. He entered the examination room and the doctor closed the door. I couldn't believe the words that had come out of his mouth. Tom. He called me Tom. How? Why? Who are those two men? I have no idea what to make of this. I live in a rural part of Colorado, on a farm close to the infamous Riverdale Road. A lot of strange goings on along that road, let me tell you. People have claimed to have seen all kinds of apparitions while traveling down it. One part of the road even leads off to a mansion that was once the headquarters of a satanic cult. Some folks say that the gates to hell are located there by the chicken coop, but that doesn't really have anything to do with this story. At least, I hope it doesn't. I must have been 14 years old at the time, doing some schoolwork at home, when, all of a sudden, my brother came running in, hollering, said that a mangy dog had wandered onto our property. My dad and I went out to take a look with him. Lo and behold, there was a humongous Doberman standing about 20 yards from our house, completely motionless. It didn't look healthy at all. Dobermans are almost always black, with patches of brown. This one was off-color, gray, and covered in blisters. It looked as if it was decomposing, despite still being alive, if only barely. Its eyes, they weren't like alive creatures. They were stark white, like it was blind or something. No pupils or color at all. It was panting heavily, and just looked at us, begging to be put out of its misery. We had no idea where it could have come from. There wasn't another house near ours for as far as the eye could see. And of the houses that were nearby, well, none of them had a Doberman. My dad didn't want the thing to suffer, and he certainly didn't want it spreading disease to our livestock. So he got his rifle and told us to go back inside. We knew what he meant. We went back and switched on the TV. No more than a few seconds later, we heard a shot ring out from the outside. My dad then dug a grave and buried the poor creature in a patch of unused land away from our house. That night, we all woke up to the sound of aggressive barking from outside. That was odd. We got up to check what it was. Outside our house was another Doberman looking identical to the one that had wandered onto our property in the day. This one, too, was diseased-looking, missing half its fur and covered in lumps. Where were these dogs coming from? Like the one before, this one was just standing motionless, waiting in the exact same place. What were different this time, though, were the eyes. They were still stark white, but they weren't like before. They were shiny the color of the moon, like they were glowing. They stood out against the darkness of the night. Where are you poor creatures coming from? My dad asked it, rhetorically. Look away, boys, he said. We ignored his command. After staring at the beast for a few moments, my dad raised his rifle again and fired at the animal's head. It collapsed to the ground. Ah, get back to bed he told us. 
We did as he said this time, but couldn't get much sleep. Dad went to dig another grave beside the one that he had made earlier. But that's the thing. The grave he'd dug for the other dog was empty. It had been dug out from the inside. The dog he'd just shot, it was the same dog as before. He placed the strange animal back in the empty hole, filled it back up with earth, and retired to bed. We all put it down to the creature's will to live. Next morning, when we all woke up, we went to check on the grave. The damn thing was empty, dug out from the inside again, tracks leading off to the woodland near our house. After that, we never saw the dog again, though to this day, about once every three months, we hear that same barking coming from the woods near our house. Occasionally when we do, we'll look outside the window and see one of our farm animals standing in the exact same place that dog stood, just watching us, waiting for the gun. Sometimes it's a pig, sometimes just a hen. But no matter what, they always look decomposed. They never move. And, at night, they all have those bright, moon-like eyes. Had to put down at least a dozen of them over the years. I don't know what that dog brought to our farm, but it ain't going away. I was a trucker at the time, and was driving alone down the I-70 in Maryland, heading west. Must have been 3am. Real quiet, hardly any other cars on the road. I had a headache and was feeling a little sleepy, so I cranked down the window a notch and turned off the radio. Up ahead in the distance, I saw a couple of figures meandering from a bank on the left into the road. Luckily, I spotted them early, and I had time to slow down. I couldn't make out any details about them, only that it was two people shambling towards my truck really slowly, dragging their feet. Worried that something might be wrong, I brought my truck to a complete stop. I was close enough now to see that there was something not quite right about them. I could hear them groaning and gurgling since my window was open, and could just about make out that something was really off about them. Their silhouettes didn't look right. I got a little closer, and my headlights illuminated them. I could see them clearly now. In front of me were what looked like two goddamn zombies. One male, one female, both completely covered in red. The male's lower jaw was hanging on by a thread. They both had bone fragments sticking out of their clothes. Their arms were clearly broken, flailing at their sides. Much of their skin was missing like it had been scraped off or something. The woman had hardly any skin on her face at all. They were coming directly for me, and got close enough for me to get a good look at their eyes. I'd never seen redder eyes. As it turns out, there was nothing supernatural going on at all. The reality of the situation was far, far worse. Turns out that they were a couple who had got into a seriously bad car accident. They were the driver and the front seat passenger. One of their tires burst at the worst possible moment, and their car went flying, literally flying, off the road. The pair of them initially survived the crash, though the same couldn't be said for the two people in the back seat. Due to shock, blood loss and confusion, they both clambered out of the vehicle and started walking back along the road, away from the wreckage. Thought it was the end of the goddamn world when I saw him. It sure as hell was the end of theirs. I hope to never see anything as horrifying as that again. That was a real horror. Messed me up for a long time. Thanks for letting me share. Drive safe. Thank you very much for listening. A huge shout out to Anthony Salinas for making the thumbnail for this video. You can find links to his artwork in the description down below. 
Also, I'd like to say a massive thank you to all of my supporters on Patreon, especially my biggest supporters. Charles Wilson Sarah Ramirez Victor Javier Fonseca Ruiz Maracruz Cardano D. Apignani Matthew J. Bauer Anime Wim Fun with Failure Stephanie Crazy Mask Parade James Labour John Crouch Lester Lido Procupidine Netta Bob the Devil Gina Valera Philip Westra Alex Greensaw Monica Mendoza Sion of the Emperor Crawford K. MacDonald Marley Wright and Ray Price Burton Thank you all so much, a big salute to you. If you'd like to support me as well, you can also find a link to my Patreon page down in the description. Remember to subscribe if you haven't already, like the video, share it around and all that jazz, and I'll be back again very, very soon. Until then guys, you all stay spooky. And remember, the best things happen in the dark.